more often than not you hear this is I just want to be comfortable. When we say that, what we're saying, or at least what we're explicitly saying is I want to physically be comfortable. But really what we're subconsciously communicating is I want the comfort of low expectations. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. You're listening to the Barbell Logic Podcast. Uh, I'm Matt Reynolds. I'm here with my good buddy and my, you guys, some of you guys are going to freak out, my style coach. Tanner Guzzi. And here's the thing about Tanner. Tanner's a lot like the rest of us. Tanner is, you're like a manly guy. You're a client of Barbell Logic, uh, husband, dad, kind of Midwestern values kind of guy. But your full time job is you are a style coach, much in the way that we are strength coaches. Is that fair to say? That is 100% fair to say. So for me, when I've thought about style, when if I think about style coaches, <laughs> you know, I some I'm gonna th- I think about um, a fashion show in Europe where I see stuff where I'm like, no normal human would ever wear any of that stuff, you know. And I think you and I have developed a friendship over the last several years. We've gone to some conferences and spoken, and then a couple years ago, I got your book, The Appearance of Power. Mm-hmm. Uh, which you can get. It's the best place to get that. It's Amazon, right? Yep. Or I, so you can go to Amazon and get that from Tanner. And what I liked about it is, is that it, one of the things you do is you really you you showcase historical figures and historical groups of people like that that men specifically, although this really applies to all demographics, dressed in a way that would get people to perceive them in the way they want to be perceived. And the interesting thing about this is, is that for us, for coaching. We define coaching as to like actual the lifting portion of coaching is to get your client to move the way you want them to move, kind of according to a model. And what you want to do is, I think, uh, is that you want to have your clients be perceived the way they want to be perceived. And most of them aren't doing that. And so for me, um, we started working together. I started coaching you in the squats and the deadlifts. And you started coaching me in the style stuff, and it's been a blast. Yeah, it has. It's been a, it's been a great trade. So, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you for having me on. I'm really looking forward to doing a deep dive on this with you and, and with your audience. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because, especially for our audience, uh, you know the the fitness world is rife with people who are obsessed with shallow aesthetics, right? Like that's that kind of bodybuilder group of people that niche is the niche that um they all have their clothes tailored yep. they go to the gym to get seen they're looking at themselves in the mirror that when they're there like their their style is totally on point and they're sending all the right signals even when they're just in the gym that's exactly right yep. but we all know that most of them are <clears throat> douchebags and so and so <laughs> often i think that because i think we tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater in the strength community there and so you you then have this group of people who are primary listeners who are focused on strength and performance and health and quality of life. And aesthetics is a byproduct of that performance. And most of our people look pretty good. I mean, they certainly look like they lift, right? And maybe they're not quite as lean as they want to be or whatever those things are. But our experience has been, and I'll just speak for me personally, is that I didn't really know how to dress for this sort of stuff. And then and then one of the problems for a guy like me, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that could identify even if their situation is a little bit different, is I'm in the fitness industry, which is a very um it's a very casual sort of dress injury industry. But, but I'm, I'm I, I, I own a pretty, pretty good sized company. company. So, so I, I know, know that, that I'm not gonna, gonna dress like a CEO of a Fortune 500 company in you know, super nice suits all the time. This is not, that's not what we do. That's not a totally counter context to everything that you are and everything that you do. It doesn't make any sense. That's right. And so it's been really interesting to learn from you how I can dress to look the part that I am. I am, I am a strength coach. I am a lifter. I am the CEO of a pretty good sized company. And how do I bring all those things together, which are sort of a strange combination. And I'm, I've been so pleased with it that I wanted 
to have you on the show to kind of talk through some of those things. So, so let's start at, kind of at the very beginning when it's kind of interesting. Again, I see I always see the parallels and what we do with what other people do. So we start with, and what I started with with you was this very simple, basic linear progression, right? The basic lifts, three sets of five, add a little weight every time. Like it's very simple and it doesn't get complicated for a while. As a matter of fact, it doesn't get complicated until it needs to. And I've seen the same thing with the way you've handled what I'm doing. So the first thing you did was kind of take a, you had me take a bunch of pictures of like that general things that I wear. Like, you know, what do you wear at home? What do you wear out on a date with your wife? What do you wear when you go somewhere nice? It's formal. And we did all that, and you 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 kind of you kind of took inventory of what I look like. That's by the way, it's the exact same thing we do with people when our nutrition clients. We have them do a visual food diet. They literally take a picture of all the stuff they eat, and we start making changes. And so, as you start to think not just about me, but about your clients in general, because you coach lots of guys like this, what are those initial steps that you're trying to define to? to get someone to move the right direction, like take that first step or that first couple steps in the right direction for style? That's a good question. And there's there's a lot of different facets to that. The first thing, and you guys and, and especially your community are a really good example of how this happens, is the first step is I try to break guys free of this very kind of one dimensional view of what style is and why it matters. Because the, again, your your example of the bodybuilders, and we see a folk or a concern for aesthetics, or at least an affinity for aesthetics, as being vain or shallow or something else, and so you avoid that. But then you trick yourself into thinking, well, what that means then is I don't care how I look, right? right. But the reality is, is if you were to put on the exact same clothes that your typical douchebag bodybuilder wears in the gym, and you go to your powerlifting gym and you're dressed like that it's going to have a huge effect on you mentally and you're going to feel so you're going to feel ridiculous in that in those clothes right and so it's helping guys understand that you can care about this stuff and you can care about it in a way that actually starts to benefit you and it doesn't mean you have to dress like the antithesis of who it is that you are or who it is that you want to be a lot of guys make that same mistake with formal clothing right because again you doing what you do i have a lot of guys who work in the tech industry and to them a suit is anathema. Like you, you don't wear a suit. It's totally, it's just as countercultural for them as it is for you. And we have this again, one dimensional kind of false binary thinking of in order to dress better. And in order to make myself be more stylish, I have to dress more formally and that doesn't work either. And so what you and I did as far as getting started, and this is how I start with all my clients is I got to take a baseline to see where you are. And it's the same thing that it is with, with strength coaching where, yeah, you have the same kind of general baseline, but ultimately what you and I are doing and how we're adapting my training for triathlon training, because that's what I'm focusing on right now, would be very different than if I were training for a powerlifting meet. Sure. Right. And they can still be, they're still the same fundamental principles that are being followed, but those tweaks that come in there are the devil's in those details. That's right. Strength, strength still matters then fitness still matters regardless of whether the sport is pure strength right powerlifting or is something that is more even say endurance based like what you're doing right now which is competitive triathlons and right. so you bought into the strength training piece knowing that that supplemented the triathlon training right exactly. for for me I had to buy into the idea that it was okay I I could find a style that fit my culture and my niche. I mean, I'm in a niche. You yep. Know, that doesn't necessarily mean like I. You know, I look at the way actors who have played James Bond have dressed for years, and I'm like, that looks awesome. But that's not me, right? It's not my culture, and it's not my niche. And so I always thought, gosh, there's a part of me that kind of wished I could dress that way. But then, in any time I did dress that way, I was incredibly uncomfortable. Right. Like I got a 21 inch neck. How do I, you know, button in the top button and all. The, I'm just like, I, you know, and you've been at these some of these formal um, these conferences that you and I speak at and you can tell that I'm uncomfortable. Right. And you're like, dude, we can you can do better all the time. Yeah, that's right. And that's exactly what you told me. And so we, we and you didn't say that the first day we were together, the first year we were together. I think it was the third year we were together that uh, together is a weird word. <laughs> the, third weird, <laughs> the third year we knew each other and hung out were at this kind of similar sort of conferences that you finally said, you can do better than what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so you started to walk me down that path. And so what are some of those first lessons that, I mean, I can tell you what the lessons are, but you're, what are the lessons that you start with to start to identify the direction to go with somebody? 
So the big thing is understanding what your context is, especially because anybody who starts to pay attention to style stuff, whether that's YouTube channels or blogs or anything else, they're going to talk about things like fit is king or all these other kind of tactical things that are details. And that matters. And you and I definitely went through that. You and I, as we were going through your pictures, I told you the break is too long here. or These aren't fitting you in the arms right there. This is too droopy or too tight or whatever in that arena. And fit absolutely matters, right? But fit is also something that's very contextual because uh, we take this kind of idea of a suit or even gym clothes. You look at what Arnold was wearing in the 70s. Yeah. And you walk into a gym, a commercial gym wearing stuff like that today, and you're going to look absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Right. So he, he pulled it off. He did. And if, you, if you look like Arnold, you still actually might be able to walk into a gym. You'll like have that an today easier time. Still, right. <laughs> absolutely. Because context is determined by status and stuff like that. That's right. That's right. But for the majority of us, we have to be aware of what the context is. And again, we can go with this same metaphor of you walk into a powerlifting gym and you're dressed like a bodybuilder or like a CrossFitter. And you're immediately branded as an outsider and it's going to affect how other people treat you, what kind of quality of coaching you're going to get, your own internal perception of yourself. And same thing if you walk into a CrossFit box and you're wearing your singlet that you would be wearing for a a powerlifting meet. That's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's understanding what these contextual cues are and how that applies in your life with your business, with your family, with all of these, I call them tribes, basically who these tribes are that you associate with, because then we can start to piece together what does good style look like for you? Because sure. you're right. It's not these, it's these skinny joggers or the streetwear stuff, nor is it suiting. And we've landed on something for you that really bridges that gap very well. That's a great, that's a great um, lead in. It's kind of interesting. One of the things that I that I'm think I'm thankful for in our industry for us with what we do in strength is it literally doesn't matter what uh, side of the political spectrum you land on, what side of the religious spectrum you land on, like all of those different, doesn't matter what demographic you are, doesn't matter if you're old or young or male or female or skinny or fat or whatever, everybody needs to squat, everybody needs to deadlift, everybody needs to do the, the basic lifts. But it's interesting for you, you have to get into some of that. Even Let's even use like without even get, maybe getting into a more controversial section, may, maybe just like geography, like where like I live in Missouri, you live in Utah, like it's different. Like I live in Springfield, Missouri, which so if I... If I had the exact same job and did the exact same thing I do now, but I did it in Manhattan, my style would be, it would be different, right? So I live in Missouri, so it's a little bit like it's naturally going to be more Midwestern, more um, more uh, casual, more rugged. There's got to be a little bit more of that thing than in New York that even if you had the exact same job, it's going to be a little more professional, a little more refined, a little more polished. Absolutely. Right? Yep. And even like with, even with your casual stuff where what we're looking at for you are just good versions of some well-done sneakers. And if you were in South Carolina, we could be looking at boat shoes. Or if you were in the Pacific Northwest, we could be looking at Birkenstocks or moccasins or something else. And just that one little detail of geography changing and everything else being the same. And it changes things. Yeah, that's, that's really good. All right. So, so as you start to develop context first, like who is the person who are their tribes? Where do they live? How do they fit into that? What group of people are they comfortable with or what groups of people are they comfortable with? Then what is the next step that you you go towards um, with, with your clients? Body. What does and doesn't work according to their body? Because yeah, great. that is something that is the least impacted by all these contextual cues. We talk about That's things right. like what does good fit look like or what kind of colors can you wear based on skin tone and stuff like that. And I know a lot of you guys, as you're hearing this, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't want to have to think about that crap. I don't want to have to worry about my skin tone or about my contrast type or all these other little details. And the reason that I teach these guys this, and you're already experiencing this, is that it eliminates decision fatigue. That's right right? Because you don't have to worry. Well, I know one of the things that you specifically told me is I don't want to have to introduce a bunch of color into my wardrobe. That's right. Which I actually thought you were going to get me in trouble for. Like when we first started, I thought you'd be like, bro, let's expand the rainbow just a little bit. And I was like, man, I mostly wear blues and grays and you're like, and you know, and whites and you're like, perfect. Yep. And it's perfect because that, that's right. Because I've got this, like, here's what I know. Like, and for people that, pe- you know, most people know what I look like. I'm kind of a red tinted guy. Like I'm a, I'm what looks like a hypertensive white guy. Red doesn't go very, like if I wear something red, it just brings out the red in my cheeks and I get this rosacea and everybody, you know, and then if, 
so it's bad. But whereas I, if I wear a you know a, a a white or blue checkered Oxford, I've got real blue eyes, and it and the eyes pop a little better, and the super red cheeks don't. <laughs> At that point, yep. And so you look it, healthier. That, that's right. It's honestly that simple. It's not super complicated. And then when, when you told me that was okay, and you and you kind of gave out, man, here's the colors that I wear. Then it made I was like, oh, thank God. Like I don't have to. <laughs> I was like, I really don't want to wear greens, and I don't want to wear reds, and I don't want to wear yellows because that's just like it's not me. And then and then let me. We haven't even got here yet, but there you you and I talked a little bit about this in the beginning. I'm a pretty confident guy, and, and I think people know that, but I had some trepidation about, as I started to update my style, my first trepidation was with my family. I didn't want my my wife and my daughters, both of whom are, all of whom are pretty stylish, to go like, bro, what? Like, <laughs> that, That's cute, it, dad. It, it, does, it, doesn't, it does, it doesn't look like you, you know? And then same sort of thing, and then as I started, if you know, hang out with my staff or do videos for the YouTube channel to be like, what is, what's he doing? Like, I didn't want it to look like midlife crisis mode, right? I'm 41 and be like, I see what he's doing here. He's got the earring, <laughs> which I don't have, which I don't have. I didn't have the puka necklace on. Like it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't. So I, so I want to be like, Tanner, how do I, how do I start to update my style in a way that looks like me that I can be comfortable in? And then that was the other thing, right? When I was wearing, you know, I've got a lot of really nice button up, shirts that are uncomfortable because they're like starched nice suit shirts i sweat in them they don't breathe they might look okay i'm just like not so you know i then you started to go through like okay here are some of the things that i think will fit you well and i'm you know i'm a big guy that's shaped like a refrigerator box which is which is difficult right so i've got big shoulders big chest big waist big hips like i think there's some self honest there's some self honesty that has to occur here as well, right? Yep. And say like, here's where I'm at. Also, very tiny ankles, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is odd. And so, trying to figure out, okay, well, what's going to look okay there? When's it okay to tuck in shirts? What's uh, you know? And so, even to switch to something as simple as say that um, that what what I would call butcher paper button up shirts, like that felt like an unbreathable, like especially my back was butcher paper, to like an Oxford type shirt didn't change the the style that much and still look the part but all of a sudden I was like I could wear this all day like I don't have to wear this to church on Sunday mornings and then change out of it the second I get home which used to be what I would do I get home home I got to take all these clothes off and put on the shorts and the t-shirt and now I don't have to do that anymore so starting to make those changes have been a a massive change you know taking me from things like um very basic like under armor style t-shirts to Henleys which are just as as comfortable, if not more comfortable, often more breathable, very comfortable, still looks the par, and and still looks like me. Where my but just my looks a wife, little more intentional. Yeah, it looks, looks a little more intentional, right? Yep. Um, those things have been really really nice. Same thing, like tennis shoes, kind of upgrading things like that. Like you know that I'm not going to mostly wear Allen Edmonds shoes, even though those things are badass and they're awesome and they work for lots of people. And for me, like there are going to be some formal times when I might wear something like that. Yeah. But most of the time I need to wear good looking tennis shoes, which is not the same thing I didn't really understand as like Reebok Nanos or like your basic running shoes. Like you have running shoes, like you probably go out and throw on the Asics and go run around the, you know, you run around your neighborhood. But like you're not wearing, you're not wearing Stan Smith's or you're not wearing those like basic, you know, all all white or all black or whatever with a chunky heel. When you run, you wear running shoes when you run. But I was wearing running shoes all the time. Right. And yep. And it is. It's such a good distinction because you're right. You would wear your lifting shoes are different than your running shoes, which sure. are going to be different than what you box in or something else. And so we can understand the physical context of I need different shoes for different things. But then a lot of us get kind of tripped up on the idea that we can we can mess with that aesthetic context too. Because I do, I have plenty of pairs of sneakers that I've never done any sort of real exercise in. But the aesthetic variable of bringing that that casualness down to where I want it to be is much better than a pair of loafers or a pair of dress shoes or a pair of chuckas or anything else like that. Yeah, that's great. So I think my favorite conversation we've had so far in the lesson. So you've got this, your system set up great. And I, I'm I'm not coming on here to sell a bunch of memberships for Tanner, although he's an he's been incredible. I'll tell you this: I would have never seen myself hiring a, a style coach 
and it's been so much better than I would have expected. Like I was, I was a little anxious about it. Um, and you've got you, it, it's this great combination of kind of an online learning environment classes, and then one on one Zoom calls, calls, and then you know we take pictures and you can and they kind of break down like what what we're wearing for the day and things like that. And so one of my favorite discussions we've had so far is the discussion about the the relationship between as you start to figure out your actual style between things like rugged looks, rakish looks, which I had never even, I had seen you type that term before, but I didn't know what it, exactly it was. And um, what's the third one, the classic, what do you call it? Refined, all, yep. they're all ours. So refined, rugged, rakish. And so you actually have your clients take a test and they answer a bunch of questions. It's almost like a personality test. Like if you've ever taken like a Myers-Briggs or an Enneagram type thing, you take it and it's, it doesn't take very long. I don't know, it's 20, 25 questions, something like that. It's not not very long. And then it kind of breaks down those things for you. Like here's how you lean. And when I took that for me, it was, I think because of my age and um, I, I, I don't necessarily want to use the word status, but just because like I'm older and I own a company at this point and that then that refined was kind of the driving force with kind of a rugged undertone, which I think comes from the fact that I live in the Midwest. I own some rural land. I'm I'm sort of attracted to that look. When your whole business is built around strength, it's all physical. That's right. It's a little. It's right. It's a little more rugged. And and that. How would you describe what the rakish look is for our audiences? It's rebellious, and the whole term even comes from. I'll nerd out on this with you for a second. So it came from pirates because they didn't upkeep their ships properly, and so the mast would rake, and so that was one of the way that the colonial sailors would be able to identify if it was a pirate ship or not because that that mast was raking and it was rakish and so it's this whole symbol of rebellion being an outsider being an iconoclast that kind of stuff i would equate it to and you i hope hopefully you would say this is generally fair of what my traditional thought is of a hipster mm -hmm. because because their very look or the thing they do is sort of counterculture right like we're not going to do the thing that's normal we're going to do the thing that's not normal. So they're the first the hipsters are the first ones to wear the skinny jeans. They're the first ones to wear like the the big cat glasses again. They're the first ones to wear the big hats. They've got big beards. They've got like there's there's and some of those things turn into like the, the funny thing about the hipsters, right, is that is that they influence culture enough that it, it starts to turn back in back into mainstream and what may even be looked at in other some of those other like refined and rugged categories is kind of so it's that um so, so for example, that original idea of, you know, 10 years ago of the lumber sexual, right, which would have probably been 10 years ago rakish is now because it's become so popular has become back into the rugged side, right? Yep. Because nobody was dressing that way, right. 10 or 12, whatever it was, and the hipsters did. So when I think of that, so for me, I would look at that, I would like you to, and you, you showed me a tons of pictures of of people that were dressed that way. And I'd be like, that, that that actually looks awesome on them. I would never wear that. Yep. And so it wasn't really about judging like the style itself as being wrong. It was that in this almost actually honestly in the same way that I would look at the way the way the James Bond characters dress. And I'd be like, that guy looks awesome in that. Um it'd be hard for me to pull that off, you know? And so um and that was kind of the way I looked at that that kind of rakish style. Um let and me so let me, me dive a little deeper on that yeah. real quick, just because no, sure. a lot of yeah. guys even hear the hipster stuff, and there's some there's this kind of negative connotation with it. But you can even look at like my my original foray into even caring about style started off with the rakish because I was I went to a private school like a private Christian school where it was the gray slacks and the navy blazer and the rep tie and everything, and I was really involved in punk rock and BMX. I wanted green liberty spikes and battle jackets and everything yeah. else, and there was that. Or you can even again the historical examples like we talk about in the book. You can look at the Romans versus the Goths and the Visigoths and the Vandals and that these Roman kids were starting to dress like the Goths and the Visigoths because mm -hmm. it was a rejection of what their society was and how it was becoming. And so that rake has existed forever. And it's just basically, are you holding up a middle finger to whatever the mainstream expectations of your appearance are? That's so interesting. Yeah, I don't it's I don't know that I've ever said this on the podcast. So I have a minor in in Arab Israeli conflict. I didn't know that. Isn't that interesting? My bachelor's double major is, is history and religious studies, and then I did a minor in Arab Israeli conflict. And the interesting thing is, is in in 
Israel slash Palestine, mm -hmm. that um, the worst thing you could possibly do to rebel, by the way, I understand this. I'm painting a big middle of the bell curve. So a lot of you out there are not in, I'm talking about all Western. Very generalized. Of, I'm, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there are a ton of, a ton of uh, Arabs and Muslims and Jews that all listen to this. But there, the worst thing you can do if you're a Jewish kid is date a Palestinian kid and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I and so we read these stories, and that's exactly what they do. So they have this kind of base style that you could, you know. I mean, look, they all kind of come from the same. Like if you follow the if you follow the lineage long enough, like they come from the they're all coming from Abraham. That's the deal, right? And so um, so it's hard to just pick them out by look. You pick them out by style and culture and what the kids are doing. The teenagers they date each other and then they start to dress alike, and it's this weird combo of sort of. Jewish clothing and Palestinian clothing within the same, and of course the parents hate it because it's right? all to piss off the parents. That's exactly right. It's that it's out of rebellion, and so it was really interesting to see how they would how they would play that combo. I love well. that. And you and I, who don't understand that culture at all, or at least I, because you do, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference in those little nuanced details. I have no idea what the difference between Jewish or sure. Palestinian aesthetics yep. are, but because they're so tight within those two tribes they know. And that's, that's the right. same thing. You would probably be able to put, again, a CrossFitter, a powerlifter, and a bodybuilder in front of them. Like, I don't know. They're all just muscly dudes. I don't know. But for us, we can yeah. look at that. I know exactly, yeah, I know what exactly that who they does. are. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly right. Yeah. So it was really interesting to me and, and actually sort of a, I think sort of a stress reliever to identify that, okay, like here, here's a style that we think works for you. And so then we could actually start pressing into that style or how does that style work within, again, work within our tribe, work within the people that we're in culture with and, and in community with on a daily basis. And, and again, I don't want to get away. Like, I want to be really clear about the fact that I was, I was kind of fearful about, here's what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to shock anybody on any given day. Like, and, and, and maybe that's part of the reason that I, that I skewed away from the rakish. The rakish is very, because it's, it's so, such a, this is like the rebellious look. I didn't want to be rebellious. I kind of wanted I, I wanted that look like when like when my wife gets her hair redone at a really nice place and somebody's like and you know then you see her and you're like, "Man, you look really nice, but you can't quite put your finger on it." That's what I wanted, right? I wanted the thing like, "Man, he's he looks like he's got his shit together." That's what I wanted. And I think it's worked. It's worked really well. And so, um where do we go from here? Like what's the what are those next several steps to figure out really what works and what doesn't? And um, like, what are some of these? And then how does that carry over to life lessons as well? Like, what are you seeing? One of the things we talk about so much in the podcast is these ideas of voluntary hardship and helping helping people be uh, build confidence rather than I think that's a huge part of it, right? Is this when you're able to squat every day or, you know, every third day, whatever, three days a week and and you get stronger, and you're refined by the fire of strength training, it builds confidence. It doesn't strip confidence. Totally. How does this do the same thing for us? I love that you asked that question because it ties into a lot of what guys focus on because more often than not, you hear this and you've expressed this yourself is, I just want to be comfortable, right? Yeah. We hear that all the time. That's a very common relationship that men have with clothing. And what's funny is, when we say that, what we're saying, or at least what we're explicitly saying is, I want to physically be comfortable because my basketball shorts, my oversized ironic t-shirt, or the one that, you know, my company gave out as part of bonus night last year or whatever, that's what I'm, that's what I'm comfortable in. That's what feels good. But really what we're subconsciously communicating is I want the comfort of low expectations, right? I want to be comfortable having people just see me the way that I am. They don't expect anything more of me. I'm not outside. I'm not trying too hard and failing because the, the hard thing about style, think about if every time somebody watched you lift, you were doing it at a meet and right. they saw every single failure. They saw every single success. They saw every single time you did it. That would turn a lot of people off to lifting, right? That's right. But you can do it in some, and that's why a lot of people have a hard time going into a gym, even just from the get-go. They're like, I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't want to look like that's a right. moron when all these other people know what they're doing. But you get to the point where you can do it at least somewhat privately. You realize that nobody else at the gym is paying attention to you or you're working out from home and you can do it privately. You don't have the luxury of doing that with your clothes. That's right. You have to practice and fail and succeed in everything else publicly. 
And so a lot of guys get really turned off by that. But when you learn how to do it right and you learn how to create a sense of style, that's not only congruent with who you are, but it's also congruent with the best version of who you are, then that's where confidence really starts to come in. Because most people, when they think about appearance, most men, when they think about style, they think about how other people perceive them. And that matters for sure. And that's why we talk about tribe and all this other stuff. But what's way more important, and you've expressed this to me multiple times as we've gone through this process, is what it does for your own perception of yourself. Yep. How much it boosts your confidence when you catch a reflection in the mirror or in that building downtown and you see the best looking version of yourself looking back at you. And then you subconsciously realize, okay, if I'm capable of that in this arena, then how much more am I capable, capable of that in other arenas? Yep. Right. Or we can even look at it as another way that it has a huge effect on confidence is the placebo effect where it is a, it's a self-induced placebo. Again, we can, we can tie this into strength and stuff. A lot of guys, and I'm sure for you, a lot of you guys who are listening, this is very much the case. When you put on the right gym clothes, you perform better in the gym That's because right. you feel like you have now entered into the arena, your mindset changes, you're in the mode, you're in the zone. Same thing if you're going into a competition and you put on the uniform, you put on the singlet, you put on whatever it is. We see this in sports all the time. Our mindsets change when we can trigger that change by putting on certain articles of clothing. And what's cool is that's not just limited within that one particular arena. We can do that when we're going out on a date, when we're going out to work, when we have to do some big major task or whatever else. Zoom calls. Exactly. It's been amazing over the last couple of months, things like doing a Zoom call, especially like if I'm doing a Zoom call with, you know, somebody who is a, a, a big business um, acquaintance companion. If I'm doing a, an inter, if I'm interviewing a new for a new position at the, at Barbell Logic, if I'm just if I'm talking to my leadership team, like it changes, and so you start to say like, okay, I want to give the appearance even on a Zoom call, even in the midst of COVID and everybody's in quarantine, I want to present the look I I like to present. And by the way, that doesn't also just fit. It's kind of funny you think about like both. If you look at the backgrounds for both of us right now, like the backdrop, so you've got this like kind of great uh, three portrait on canvas picture of a Buffalo. Is it tied into like a mountain line? It's also the mountain, Rocky mountain line, the Rocky mountain. So like, so like the body of the Buffalo or kind of the Rocky mountains. And then, and then on the far right side, you've got this, you can see his head and you've got these great kind of chunky dark wood shelves with books on it. Some of your favorite books behind you. Same thing. You know, I've got this like nice office behind me, like the setup, you can kind of see like it looks the part. I'm amazed at how often people do Zoom calls and, you know, there's there's dirty laundry behind them everywhere or there's and you're like, hey, don't you. Don't, and so I think most of our listeners would think to themselves like, well, that per, that makes sense. Like pick up the dirty laundry for the Zoom call. And then yet they'll do an important call with important people and they'll still put on the cargo shorts and the, you know, and the and the T-shirt and the ball cap and look like they're a frat boy from 2001 and it's like, that's not, that's not the, that's not the, totally counterproductive. That's because you're trying to give an appearance of a perception of, I want them to think that I'm this and not because you're trying to play the hypocrite because you are that, or because you're desperately trying to be that not because I want to try to be somebody I'm not, but because that is who I actually am. As a matter of fact, when you dress like the frat boy, I'll use me. When you're the 41 year old CEO of a company, you're dressing as someone that you're not. Right. And so to change into the person, so you know, to come back to that comfort piece, there are times when I have, you know, I've spent I've spent some money on on tailors and and alterations for clothes before I met you, and I can pull off a look that looks really nice but is incredibly uncomfortable to me. Yep. I'm sucking in my gut the whole time. Like if I hit it just right, that like I look good, but it's it's it doesn't feel right. And one of the things that's been nice working with you is that now I've I've found some some outfit, some style for me that is incredibly comfortable, feels like me, looks way better. I I'm not like how do I get home from the dinner so I can take all these clothes off and change into like Lulu pants again. Yes. You know, I mean, it's, and so that's been the, that's been one of the biggest changes for me is being able to go and, and maybe it's made a big, it's been kind of perfect timing for me as well that the whole world has been closed. And now Missouri has started to open up just a little bit. I've been able to go on dates with my wife for the first time and yeah, reemerge out of the cocoon. That's exactly right. And so to, to go somewhere and have a nice dinner, but then also feel great about both the way I look and the way I actually feel 
it is actually comfortable. And it's yep. it's been amazing that some of the stuff that that you've been able to find for me feels like I'm wearing those Lulu sweatpants and the long sleeve t-shirt. It's not. They look better. They're just as comfortable. Exactly. It's those been are really the, nice. Style and comfort are not mutually exclusive. And I always thought they were. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I always thought I always thought they were. Tie that into this whole idea of context and these little things where because you live in the Midwest, you live in an air conditioned home. You travel right. in an air conditioned vehicle to go to an air conditioned office or eat in an air conditioned restaurant. And if it's not air conditioned, then it's heated. Like we live in a climate controlled world. That's right. Whereas if you were in the Lower East Side in New York and you had to walk 10 blocks to be able to get to the subway, then all of a sudden cashmere starts to make a lot more sense. Right. Or if you're out doing ski trips and it's 40 below, then that cashmere makes a lot more that's sense. That's exactly right. So yeah. That context, again, is what makes all this work. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And actually, some of the I love some of the rugged stuff I have, and I'm excited to wear it in the wintertime. And we go out, you know, my family's got a place out in Colorado, and we go out there. Like, I'm like, this will work out there. Like, I can't wear it here. It's right. It's never cold enough here to actually pull that thing it's my off. My cabin clothes. That's that's exactly right. So it's it's been a blast. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about for just almost like rapid fire here. Uh, lifters are notorious. I want to, I'm going to tell you a, an, an article of clothing that I see lifters wear all the time uh, in our culture. And I want you to give me a, a nice change of pace. Like, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? A replacement for that. Is that the right word? That, that is, that is just a step up without being like, that's not going to freak anybody out. Right? So let's start with the one that we hear the most about cargo shorts, khaki, Abercrombie and Fitch, 1998, hang below the knees, giant pockets on the sides, cargo shorts. You got a lot of guys that are our lifter guys who have like, that's that's when they bought them, by the way. They bought them when they were in college in 1999. And they're like, but they're so practical. My, I can, you know, my EDC is perfect. I can, I can, you know, I can carry a knife in there and I can carry a gun and my wallet, my giant George Costanza wallet that's four inches thick can fit in. <laughs> what is, what would be the first thing? How would you replace something like that? Okay, so I would still opt for cotton shorts. That's basically like a chino short, but you just change a little things, a few little things about the fit. You make them rather than being below the knee, which is going to make your torso look way too long, and it's going to make you look like a gorilla and all disproportionate. You have them be two or three inches above the knee, especially because if you're doing all your squats, then you should have that great teardrop there in your quad. Show that off. You've earned right. it. Show that off, right? And then depending on how big your thighs are, you want it to be. You don't want it to be skinny. You don't want it to be so snug that it limits your range of motion or anything else like that. But you also don't want it to be so baggy that you look like you have these little toothpicks of calves that right. are sticking out. Of or that you could like parachute out of a plane in them. Exactly. If you could parachute out of a plane and not die, then the shorts are too big. That's a problem, right. <laughs> and so keep them trim without going skinny. You stick with neutral colors like navy or khaki or gray or something else like that. And realistically... You should be slimming down the wallet. You can carry inside the waistband or appendix or something else like that. But yep. honestly, even if you had to go all the way to EDC, they still make really good looking slim, uh, higher cut cargo shorts that can still look really good as opposed to just looking like I peaked in 1999. I've never improved since then. And I'm desperately holding on to this style from back when I was cool. Yeah, that's great. I, um, I just found one of the things that, that's just we're in the process of taking some time. I've seen a lot of a lot of cool stuff that I've ordered over the last couple of weeks. You get them in, 50% of it fits awesome. 50% of you're like, ah, it doesn't fit quite as right as I need to. And then once I find the one that I really like, then I just buy every color in that one, right? That's what I do. Print it. So that's right. So uh, so first off, I, I have no sponsorships with any of these people. Um, I found some great Bonobos khaki chino shorts. I went with the seven inch. Here's the deal. I converted to shorter shorts a while ago. Lulu, I started, you know, everybody... Most of these guys that I see are wearing 11 to 13 inch inseam. I would suggest going to a nine inch first so it doesn't freak you out too bad. Nine's great, right? And then eventually you'll throw on those sevens and you'll be like, bro, seven inch inseam is where it's at. Exactly. I love those shorts. They're super comfortable. They're as comfortable as any short I've ever worn. And actually, the price isn't bad either. I can inside the waistband carry if that's what I'm doing. If you are really a tactical person, really into that, 511 makes a lot of good stuff too. They've got like their urban wear stuff is the same sort of thing, right? So it's not they're like you listen, you don't want to look like a DEA agent. So and they do have stuff that's made for that, but like that's not what we're looking for, right? 
So there are some companies out there like 5.11 that make some some really decent like khaki looking shorts or pants that look really like just they look like a nice pair of chinos. Yep. But they've got very like way more smaller profile pockets, but they can still carry some of the stuff that you exactly. want. Exactly. So Another good company for that is Cool K U H L. That's okay. who all my like camping cargo shorts and everything. Awesome. That's the only time that I wear. But same thing, nice slim profile, really easy, good stuff from those guys too. How about uh, tennis shoes? I know almost all of our guys. So first off, I always joke about the neat dad shoes. So if you're wearing a pair of white and blue New Balance with the one and a half inch thick soles on them, like that's made for barbecue and Saturdays. You got to throw them in the trash unless you're doing it just as a joke. And then it's awesome. Uh, what and the, the Nike makes one like those, too. But for people who are wearing for our listeners who are wearing like the standard sort of they're wearing Nike Metcons they're wearing Reebok Nanos. They're wearing they're, they're wearing more kind of cross training tennis shoes. Yes. But you've just converted from the big baggy khaki cargo shorts to the regular comfortable khaki chino above the knee shorts. What's a what's what are some good conversions for tennis shoes out of that? I'm look like I'm gonna go on a run to like, hey, I could actually go eat dinner with my family in these. Cool. Okay, so I'm gonna give you some principles to be able to judge by, and then I'll give you some brand recommendations and some Perfect. specific styles. Okay, so the way to do this is you want to go old school. You want to get into something that looks like it's been around forever, and so. The older it is, that means the more longevity it has, which means the more it's going to look like it's classic instead of just like dad outdated. I, I've held on to things from the 90s. So that's the first principle. Second principle is you want to stick with natural materials. So that's going to be canvas, leather, suede, stuff like that. Yep. Okay. And then the third principle, you can play with this one a little bit depending on how rugged or rakish or anything you are, but stick with simple colors. Yep. White is really good on most guys, but even blacks or browns, but you don't need all of these like crazy camo patterns or anything else like that. You don't, you're not going to get too wild with any of that. Yeah, right? that's great. So as far as some, some actual pairs to check out, um, the Adidas Stan Smiths are pretty much impossible to fail at. They're which, I, which I now have four pairs of. Right, yeah. Because, because they're cheap and they look great. And they come in, they come, you know, I've got the white, I've got the white on blue, I've got the black on black. <laughs> the, I'm like, all right, I got it. And they're super comfortable. So easy to get on, super comfortable. Like you don't feel... Any any more restricted in these or any of the other brands that will recommend compared to what you are in your Metcons or your Nanos no, or anything else like all. that. So they're a great one. Um, Converse, your Chuck Taylors, your kind of standards yep. there, whether that's ho top, high top or low top is going to be really good to go. Uh, New Balance has a model called the 247, which is a really good kind of a classic wedge shape as opposed to a lot of their other stuff that can look a little bit too daddish. And then old school Nikes like the Internationalist or the Jordan 1 or the yeah. – Pegasus 8380, those kind of uh, more classical are all, they all fit that bill really, really well. Yeah. Those Stan Smiths, I like, they're, those are like actual tennis. They are. That, that, that tennis Stan was a tennis From like player. the 70s, right? Or something like that. So, so, so it's, you know, it's crazy the way they carry over. Uh, all right. How about the logo t shirt? <laughs> <laughs> so you got that t shirt and it says Under Armour across the front, or, or maybe it just says barbell logic your crowd like maybe it's a maybe it's a, a company you really love which is probably completely appropriate to go to the gym and like lift in but what what's a good replacement for that for again like just you know not having a casual dinner maybe it's a barbecue at home like what's the what's the direction to go there okay so two options here the first one is still just do a t-shirt but do it so that it doesn't have any logos and it's plain and make sure that it fits right so the keys to pay attention to here are are the length of the sleeves because you want them a lot of guys especially bigger guys because you have to get into this extra large drapey stuff because you're just buying crappy brands to do it but you find brands that work well and you get into sleeves that come down in the middle of your bicep and then they hold onto the bicep relatively well as opposed to being really big and drapey because what sucks is when you put in all this effort to get your biceps up to 19 or 23 inches or whatever it may be and then they look scrawny because your t-shirt's still too big. Yeah, because you got a giant sleeve or a sleeve that goes all the way down to your elbow and is drapey on the elbow because it's a lot smaller in diameter than the bicep and tricep Exactly, are. and so it just minimizes all that work that you've put in, at least as far as the aesthetics of it. Another thing to pay attention to is you want the shoulder seam, which is basically where the sleeves attach, 
to not drip down to where it's hanging halfway off your deltoid because that in and of itself looks sloppy, but that's also going to contribute to making the sleeves look longer than what they actually are. So have it sit right at the top of the deltoid. And if you can find stuff based on your build that works well, then it hugs the chest and the shoulders really well and it shows off good size there and makes your traps look like they're big, but then it's a little bit looser down through the waist and the seat. If you are shredded, then this is good because then it doesn't look saran wrapped and you don't look one dimensional like, hey, everybody, you can tell I've got abs, right? You can see my abs, you know, I've got abs, you can see my, right? Or if you do have a little bit of waist to hide, then it's easy to hide that. And yeah. so tight through the chest and the shoulders, some drape through the waist and the seat, and you're good to go. Yep. Okay, so that's the first one. That's the way to do t-shirts. The section, second option is to basically do the same principles of fit, but you do what's called a Henley, and we've already talked about that. And it's basically a t-shirt, but it also has buttons on the front. It's called a placket where it would button up. So think of it as like a t-shirt material, but that buttoning part, the placket is like a polo shirt, but then it's also collarless like a polo or like a t-shirt is as well. And basically, if you think of like old timey 19th century underwear or long yeah. johns or stuff like that, it's that kind of thing. But it just adds so much intentionality, so much style, and it isn't going to wear any less comfortably than a good t-shirt will. Yeah, and in the summertime, it's great to wear by itself, but in the wintertime, it's also great to, as a sort of a base layer. Yeah, so um, we've moved a lot to that. Okay, great piece there. Anything about, like, what about for our middle-aged guy who is a lifter, who's listening to this podcast, who's going to dress like a lifter, what, a, what are the other little places, like hats, sunglasses, watches, that they can get like what or whatever those are like should we do necklaces should we do bracelets and i know a lot of that depends on like the style that's your you know how much are you refined versus how much are you rakish versus whatever those things are but are there some kind of go-to's that you'll you'll look at as well yes okay um first of all when you are wearing shorts wear no show socks they look ridiculously right. dainty and effeminate if you don't have your shoes on because they look like these little ballerina slippers but nobody sees that unless it's you or your wife or whatever when you're actually putting stuff on. But over the calf socks or like your regular athletic socks or ankle socks, they just look dopey daddy. And so be yeah. willing to show off your ankles all the way when you're wearing your sneakers with your shorts. For sunglasses, get rid of the Oakleys and the wraparounds and everything else like that because they are appropriate when you're on the baseball diamond or you're riding the road bike or whatever else it may be. But you're basically you're going to want to stick with classic uh, aviators, you know, think Top Gun and all that kind of stuff. Those styles yeah. have been around forever or your Wayfarers, which again, have been around forever. That's the kind of stuff that the Jack basic Kennedy Ray-Ban. Yeah. yeah, your basic Ray-Bans. Really, really simple there. For hats, this is where depending on a, a quite a few different things, but okay, a lot of guys make the mistake of I want to dress more stylishly, so I'm going to adopt the newsboy hat or the the trilby or the fedora or the anything. And most of those, they just look super dorky. And so you're fine wearing baseball caps. If you want to lean a little bit more old school and kind of up that refinement, then stick with something that's even like a classic wool or a felt, like literally what the baseball players wore back in the, 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 ten, the tens and the twenties of the 20th yeah. century. Or you can even stick with just regular, just keep the logos minimal and everything else like that. Like you're, I've seen your black, like on black barbell logic ones and they're great. Yeah. And that yeah. that's totally appropriate and works totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed that any, anything like shoes, t-shirts, hats that have like an in your face logo. So to, to not step on anybody's toes today, it reminds me of like the late nineties, Tommy Hilfiger shirts. Like you had the gray shirt with a giant Tommy Hilfiger logo. Like, Hey, listen, we're all grown ups at this point. We don't need to we don't need to advertise the brand we're wearing. We don't buy clothes for branding anyway. We buy clothes because they're high quality and comfortable and they fit our they fit our style, not because I'm trying to show off like, oh, I've got red bottom Christian Louboutin. So you're like, listen, here's my Gucci belt. That's right. It doesn't matter. Like, listen. So that's one of the things for me is just to be able to find the thing so that it doesn't, it's not about the the brand or the logo. It's about the fit and the style and it's it's portraying what I want to portray. Um, last important question there on the on the trade-off, and I, I almost forgot this one is the button up. So guys that have the class, this this like I talked about, this kind of classic, everyone has needs where they they need to wear button up shirts. Um, and for me, I had all of these nice and relatively expensive shirts that like didn't breathe, overstarched, felt like butcher paper, 
What are some good what are some good replacements for those? So the best replacement is the Oxford cloth button down. And you can really like their menswear world is all obsessed with these. There's even the acronym of OCBD. Like you can go deep down this rabbit hole. But the real benefit to these are one, they're more casual because the way that the, the cotton is woven, it's a more open weave and that adds texture. And the more texture there is to your shirt, the more casual it appears. So first off, I had to ask you this question the other day because I wasn't entirely sure. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I thought an Oxford just meant button down collars. And you were like, it's actually the, the weave. The weave of the, of the cotton. Yep, absolutely. And it usually does have button down collars. Typically, right. Because it's a more casual shirt because of all that texture and the open weave and everything else like that. But I've got Oxford shorts. It's just the material, the way that that cotton is woven. Okay, got it. Well, and the thing I tend to like about that Oxford too is it, it, it one, it's very versatile as far as I can tuck it in with a pair of chinos. I can tuck it in with jeans or I can untuck it with jeans and it works just fine, right? Yep. I can roll the sleeves. I can not roll the sleeves. It layers really well when it's cold. It works with a Henley underneath it if it's cold and then and then as a main layer, and then you can even do a top layer of a vest or a field jacket or something over. All of those things tend to work really well. And so it's a super versatile, super comfortable shirt. The first time I put it on an actual no shit Oxford, I was like, oh, my God, this is like it looks just like the other shirt. I, you know, it doesn't look quite as formal, but it looks the part. And I was like, I could I could wear this. I could go camping. In it. I'm not going to go camping in this, but I could go camping in it and be comfortable. It's that much more comfortable. It's that big of a deal. And that's where the texture and the weave and everything else, that's why it matters so much. And you're right as far as the versatility, because you can, you can do it with a pair of shorts and some sneakers and roll up the sleeves, or you can do it all the way up to a more casual suit, like a linen or a tweed suit or something else like that. More often than not, when I'm in jeans and a sport coat, I've got an OCBD on. Like it is yep. the the range as far as formality or environments or anything else like that. It's huge. Now, the other thing to pay attention to with this is a lot of you guys may be tempted to think, okay, but I don't want to look like everybody else. I want to stand out and I'm going to do some cool patterns with my shirts. And patterns, yes, they're doable, but for the most part, when you get your fit dialed in, when you're wearing more interesting textures, when your stuff all looks the way that it's supposed to, you don't have to cheat and wear patterns and it actually makes your style better. And like we were talking about with branding and logos, it gets people to pay more attention to you than they pay attention to the clothes. And it comes back to even what we were talking about 20 minutes or so ago as far as he looks better, but I can't tell why he looks better because right. he's in just a pair of dark jeans and a baby blue shirt and some good shoes, but wh why does it look so much better than like what I, Michael Scott wears or some other kind of great example yeah. of really, really bad style? And it's all these little details as fit, material, and all this other stuff. We don't need to worry about pattern or color very much. Yeah, let's um, let, let's talk really quick about fit because one of the easiest things you can do, like for me, one of the first things you called out that I didn't even realize, and then once I looked at it, now it makes me ill, is all of my jeans and all of my pants were way too long. Yep. Way too much break, way too much extra fabric at the bottom, and it just looks sloppy. And that that this may be one of the most perfect examples of I don't know why he looks better or why he looks well put together, but like a correct length jean or pant looks so much better, especially on a middle aged guy, than a than a too long pant, right? I, I remember back in the day, like in the early 2000s and late 90s, like it was cool to get like the fraying on the back of your jeans, like for that very reason, you know? And I think often we get stuck into the, the culture and the style, not just fashion, you think about music or whatever, like the thing that was popular when you were 18 to 22, because you were into that kind of stuff at the time. And, and that, you know, now I'm not 22, I'm 42. Right. I'm like, hey, I don't need to wear jeans. I'm not a 34 inch inseam jean. I thought I thought I was. I'm a 32 that still needs to be hemmed. Like that's the and yeah, so you're what like I did right the 31. Yeah, that's right. That exactly what I did was I I literally I went to and I if you if you guys haven't done it, a a good tailor or a good alterations place is incredibly cheap mm -hmm. to take a lot of the clothes that you have. So I've I've had I've had all of my button up shirts. I've had them correctly fitted right like yep. seam on the shoulder in the right spot sleeve length brought in again sleeves often too long you know they'd be tight and look pretty good tight in a good way up on the bicep and then just like massive on the forearm and extra extra cloth 
if I, you know, so many of us are big guys with big shoulders and big arms, and then you have to buy that shirt and it's like a muumu in the waist. So they have to bring in the waist a few inches. But like to get a shirt tailored, it's like $15. And to get, to get jeans hemmed is like $10 or $15. And you don't even have to go to a good tailor to get your jeans hemmed. Yeah, and anybody. If they're can do open, that. they can do that. That's right. That's that's the easiest, some of the easiest stuff you can do. Uh, so so that's a that's another big deal is find a good tailor slash alterations place in your town and develop a good relationship with them so that they know what you like and they can keep and they've done man it can take they can take clothes they can actually take some of your clothes that are probably cheaper clothes cheaper branded clothes that just don't have a great fit and they can make them fit great and you can really renew your wardrobe for even just a hundred bucks 150 bucks and you can have work done on 10 or 15 different articles of clothing that within a week it's almost like you've completely re-updated your style. Yep. And the best part about it is nobody's going to look at you like you are any different because you're wearing the same clothes That's and those right. tweaks are so small. So you're not going to feel like you're in some weird costume. You're not going to have people from your family or from work or whatever else being like, oh, wow, you've changed. It's just going to look better and nobody's going to be able to identify why. That's right. That's great. Awesome. So uh, I want to I wanna talk about uh, how they can find you on the way out. Here's Here's the way I'm going to pitch this. You can go to Amazon and get The Appearance of Power, which is what I would – I look at your book as a – it's a mindset book. It it changes the mindset of why it's okay to care about style. Let's be honest. The the our, our niche in the strength community is very – they think – maybe unfairly, they think masculinity means I don't care about style. Mm-hmm. And then you go and look at the warriors of history past, right? You look at the way – the Shogun dressed. You look at the way the American Indians dressed. You look at the way that, like the the cowboys, the pirates. The you know, you talk about this like kind of the warrior sense, the way warrior class that cared the most about their aesthetic. That's right. They always cared. They always cared. And they had the to earn bad- the right to dress like them. That's right. And they're the biggest badasses. And so a great place to start is to pick up Tanner's book. He didn't ask me to say that at all. Uh, it's a great book, and it will change your mindset on the on the kind of overarching kind of philosophy of this first. And then if they want to get some practical help, how do they reach out and find you? And I, by the way, I also know that you, t- you take a similar approach to, the, to than what we do to what we do uh, by putting out a ton of great high value content for free. Mm-hmm. So, so where can they go to start to see some of your content? If they're like, Hey, I just want to dip my toe in right now. I'm not sure that I want ready to pull the trigger. Where's the best place to find your stuff. So go to masculine dash style.com. There are a ton of articles and everything that's there to link to a bunch of YouTube videos that I've done. And then really to kind of get you guys started and get you in on the path on everything, I have a limited version of what that archetype quiz, as far as the rugged, refined, and rakish that, you know, I do this advanced version with my clients, but I do a limited version with you guys where you can take those same questions and then it'll tell you which of those three archetypes is your primary. It'll tell you if you're rugged, refined, or rakish. That gets you on my mailing list. And then I send you a bunch of really good deep dives as far as, okay, you're rugged. Now what, what do you start to do with that? How do we start to make that work? Yep. Yeah. That's and great. so get in on that. That's going to give you opportunities. Cause I've got a bunch of different ways. I do one-on-one coaching, which is obviously what you and I are doing. That's where I'm the most effective. I do group versions of my coaching. I have some pretty easy subscriptions that if you just want to learn the basics of like, you know, how do I have the staples in my wardrobe? I've got all that. And so all of that is available and you can kind of choose your own adventure as far as what's going to be the most beneficial for you by starting out at the site at masculine-style.com. I love it because it it really does match our philosophy for business where it's like, Hey, you're going to put out a ton of great content for free. And, and a lot of those guys that get that content right now, maybe they're 26 years old and they don't have the finances to hire the coach, but as they follow the thing, eventually they're going to be able to have the finances to pull the trigger. But then I also like the fact that you surround yourself with a great community of people who support each other, who are all part of trying to do this thing. And we're all, we're all different archetypes. We have different places that we sort of land and, and, but you've got a great community aspect there as well. And then what I love is, listen, it is top notch service. It is not like your coaching is not the primary point of your coaching is not the automated drip classes. Mm -mm. What those do is provide the background to the one on one coaching. So very similar to when you think about coaching, what most people consider online coaching, the fitness world, what most people are selling is a cheap template. And what we're trying to do at Barbell Logic is very in-depth 
personalized, individualized training for our clients. That's what Tanner does for style. So you don't have to worry about him trying. And this was one of my concerns when I, you know, I didn't know how you were going to address this. Like, is he going to try to make me look like all the other, ever, all the other guys that I think are stylish? And the answer was no. Like you really looked at like who I was and what I did and where my niche was and where my community was and you helped me make it fit. And then it's been amazing to put on some of those outfits and make move in some of those directions and feel like way more confident, way more comfortable, feel like myself. Nobody's making fun of me as confident as I can come across. Anyway, I still have this sort of like out of my comfort zone, but to do these things that my wife, like she thinks they look great. My 15 year old daughter is like, you look great, dad. Like that, that looks really good on you. And then I, and then I hear that from them, and then I can go to the restaurant or I can go out and do that. And I, I already feel so much better about who I am. So thank you for the coaching for me personally, and, and thanks for what you're doing out there for for the community in this. This stuff actually matters. Um, you know, they always say dress as if, right? Like there's this idea of like dress the way you want to be perceived. Like if you're not there yet, you have an opportunity to actually still give that perception off. And it's not about being hypocritical. It's not about being fake. And there's nothing about Tanner's coaching that feels shallow. And I, again, it's one of those things for me that being able to find a guy who you've invested a tremendous amount of time in your marriage, in your fatherhood, in the way you divide up your your work-life balance with your family, the way you you train with your family in your garage, you see your kiddos in there, you see your wife training with you, like you are one of us and you are one of our our members of our tribe, and so uh, you've been a great a great uh, resource and asset for me. So thank you for the, the stuff you've done. Well, I can't tell you how much that means to to have you tell me I'm a part of the tribe. That means a lot. So that feels awesome. great. Thank you. <laughs> well, you got a beard, so you're in. Right, I'm in. That's the <laughs> See, deal. See, now it doesn't so, matter as much. The threshold is too low. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He also has way better hair than I do. He's got a head. He's got a head full of hair. Uh, so we got that. I, we didn't even talk about that because I've never had to worry about about hair with style because, in fact, I don't have any. But if you are, if you, you any of you listeners are starting to lose it, just go the mat route and just get rid of all of it. It's so much better, especially because you can just grow it on your face and then shave it on the head. Exactly. Low maintenance. It's low maintenance. That's for sure. So, dude, thanks for doing the show. And uh, we'll catch you guys in a couple days. Thanks for listening to the show. We'd love to have a five star review. Uh, iTunes is awesome. But anywhere that you get our podcast and you can get our podcast anywhere. You can get it on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Overcast, iTunes, Google Play, anywhere that you can get a podcast, you can get us. You know that because you're listening as I'm speaking right now. So you already know where you listen. Go give us a five-star review that helps us in the rankings and drives up so that we can reach more people for the refining power of voluntary hardship. And we'll catch you guys in another couple days. 